Well, there are two major decisions that have to be taken tomorrow. One is on this 50 billion euros in aid to Ukraine, and the other is whether to start negotiations with Ukraine about joining the European Union. It's already been designated as a candidate country, but this extra step needs to be taken. It is a political decision that needs to be taken unanimously by all 27 EU leaders. And Hungary's Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, is threatening to veto both of those things. At this stage, there's no sign that he's letting up on that insistence that he will veto that at the summit starting tomorrow. Uh, he's making two arguments there. One is that uh, he's called Ukraine a corrupt country that should not be part of the European Union. And he's also said that sending further aid to Ukraine is only prolonging the war and causing more deaths in that war. The implication being that Ukraine should just surrender to Russia and turn over those territories in the east. Now, all of this is happening in parallel to that debate across the Atlantic in Washington that you were just talking about in the U.S. Congress, where Republicans in the U.S. Congress are blocking further U.S. aid to Ukraine using many of the same arguments of Viktor Orban, saying it's not the U.S.'s place to be involved here and that it's unnecessarily prolonging the war. And actually, Viktor Orban's aides reportedly held a meeting with Republicans last week in order to coordinate the opposition to that funding. You know, interestingly, the deadline for making this decision, both in the EU and the U.S., is Friday in both cases. Uh, and so these talks over the next two days are going to be happening in parallel in Washington and Brussels. I've talked to some EU diplomats today who said, look, we really need to approve this as a signal to give support to President Biden, because a lot of the Republicans are saying this shouldn't be the Americans' job to pay for this war. It should be the Europeans' job. So if they can come and say, look, the Europeans just uh, pledged $50 billion to help to Ukraine, then it might soften the opposition among Republicans in the U.S. Congress. Others I've talked to today are worried that actually if the EU approves this aid before the U.S. has approved its aid, Republicans can say, well, the U.S. doesn't need to fund this war because the Europeans are funding it now. Let's step back. So those two discussions are going to be very much influenced by each other over the next two days. As you say, then, funding a real issue in Washington and also in Brussels this week. Now, one of the other big issues in the EU is whether or not EU leaders will extend an invitation to Ukraine to start membership talks. I mentioned Dmitry Kaleva, the uh, Ukrainian uh, foreign minister. He's rather concerned about that, as you'll hear uh, in this soundbite. I cannot imagine, I don't even want to talk about the devastating consequences that uh, uh, will occur shall the Council fail to make, to make this decision, not only with regard to Ukraine, but in a broader sense on the issue of, of enlargement uh, as a whole. Well, let's bring back in uh, Dave Keating for some reaction to that. So clearly some concern from Kuleba there, Dave. Is he right to worry? Well, it is only Hungary that is openly saying that they would veto this decision on a session. However, when you talk to people privately here, it's clear that some other countries are maybe hiding behind Viktor Orban's veto there. You have a kind of emerging block of countries which, while they supported Ukraine's accession uh, candidate status, they seem to be having second thoughts. Uh, among those are Italy, Austria, Slovenia, Slovakia, uh, which for varying reasons have started to suggest they might not be able to support taking this step to start a session talks. Now, some of that is linked to Bosnia. Some of those countries, because of geographic and historic ties, want to make sure that talks with Bosnia also go forward at the same time as Ukraine. But there is also some concern here that this is being done kind of short-sightedly, without a longer-term thinking of what the European Union is going to be, how it would manage at such an enormous geographic size, and that the countries most supportive of this are actually not supportive of reforming the EU in order to accommodate Ukraine. Now, just coincidentally, supposedly, the European Commission any moment now is expected to come out with a decision that would release some of the funds that were frozen from Hungary for its violation of rule of law. That's up to 30 billion in EU funds. We're hearing that they might just release 10 billion of that. Now, when talking to national diplomats today, they all insisted nothing to do with us. The timing is just coincidental. This is the Commission's decision, not the Council, not the national government's decision. However, the timing is obviously very suspicious, especially since just yesterday, uh, Orban's advisor said that he would need the release of those funds in order to end his veto on the extra funds to Ukraine. So it does look like there's some brinksmanship going on here. What people think might happen is that if they release those funds to Hungary, Orban drops his veto on the 
budget and the, and the funds to Ukraine, but still doesn't drop his veto on starting those accession talks. It's going to be a very interesting two days, and there's talk that this summit may extend into a third day and maybe even a fourth day until Sunday.